University of Colorado Boulder, and I'm also a member of the CU Boulder hosting team for this uh, fifth um, Himalayan Studies Conference of the Association of Nepal and Himalayan Studies. We've already had a really fantastic uh, pre-conference talk by Professor Charles Ramble uh, through the Pumba Lecture Series last night. Uh, we had a fun and I hope it was informative uh, small session with graduate students this morning. Uh, and so now uh, we're ready to formally welcome all of you uh, to the official beginning of the conference. Uh, and I think uh, we're all just very, very excited uh, to have you here at CU Boulder for the next uh, three days. So thank you for coming to Boulder. Um, it looks like there are about 166 of you who are giving talks or participating in roundtables or both. Uh, there are many more who are participating as uh, audience members, as observers, and guests. Um, and I want to especially welcome those of you who have traveled long distances to be here. And so particularly people coming all the way from India, from Nepal, uh, from Japan, Australia, Denmark, Norway, Germany, the UK, and, and other places as well. Uh, so my job up here is just to say a couple of logistical things. Um, first, I want to say thank you for your patience um, for the perhaps somewhat or unorthodox way we fashioned panels uh, around themes that we felt would make as intellectually coherent a conference as possible. Um, we realized after the fact that this you know, was a little source of dissatisfaction for some, but we hope that um, you'll be pleased with the outcome um, that, that we put together. Uh, second, the conference program on this wonderful flash drive is not up to date, uh, so consider it a historical <laughs> artifact. Um, so please look at the handout that you got. We did have a lot of last minute changes, and that was mainly due to people not getting visas uh, from South Asia. So uh, look at the piece of paper if you have internet, um, you know, you can look at that as well. But the paper was up to date. Um, third, we hope you'll, you know, I know people have made the travel plans already, um, but uh, we hope you can stay through Monday uh, for uh, the session this Monday morning. Um, the last day of the conference is always a little bit tricky. Uh, the weather forecast is beautiful. Um, it's, it's hot, but there's not going to be any rain, so there's plenty of time, uh, you know, after the conference on Monday to go on a hike or, or do other afternoon uh, outdoor things um, here. Um, fourth, I just want to say that, um, you know, as we celebrate the beginning of this conference, um, since it is about Nepal um, and the Himalayas, uh, we don't want to forget that over 1,200 people have, have died in uh, flooding um, in India, Nepal, uh, and Bangladesh. Um, Rupak, um, our peerless organizer of everything, will be, um, probably tomorrow, we'll have, um, a, a, there's a group called Photo Circle, right, mm -hmm. that is uh, doing a collection for, um, for, for people who are victims of that flooding. And so talk to him or look at the table. Um, and then a, a sort of late breaking thing that I wanna make you aware of is that um, just in the, the past couple of days, a number of um, Tibetanists in particular, um, and particularly spearheaded by Charlie Makeley of Reed College, who uh, was supposed to come but, but is not able to, um, has been spearheading a, an effort to organize a peer review boycott of um, uh, publications that censor material in China. Um, so we, um, I, I'm actually not going to read this whole thing, but basically um, we would like to call for a boycott of any journal or publisher or, um, yeah, book or, or, or uh, article publisher that is um, uh, pulling its products uh, um, from China or that is censoring its content there due to the recent flap over the China Quarterly and also um, plans to censor things from journal, journal of Asian Studies that, that was withdrawn because of, of an outcry. Um, but since then, we've also found that, for example, LexisNexis has been um, uh, uh, doing some, some censorship as well. And so the, the, um, the, the petition, which uh, we'll send out to an email as soon as the website is ready, is a, a sort of call to um, you know, remind academic publications that they have to honor that commitment uh, to broadly disseminate knowledge um, and uh, really give people in China and other places unfettered access to international scholarship. And so I just want to let you know that, that you'll be receiving that in your email. And so um, again, Charlie Makeley is uh, the, the initiator of this and um, 
some other people who have signed on already are Gray Tuttle, myself, Carol, Ralph Litzinger, um, and a number of others. So just to, to let you know that that's happening. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Holly Gailey to tell you a little bit about the Tibet Hill Malaya Initiative and how it is that we ended up doing this here. delighted to have all of you here for the next few days. And um, the way the Association of Nepal and Himalayan Studies conferences work is that each year um, of the conference, a different host university and actually host kind of institution within the university partner with ANHS to pull this off. So we benefited tremendously from Heather Hinman and her team with registration and with so many other logistics to make this conference possible. Our local host is actually the Tibet Himalaya Initiative, and you can see we have this lovely logo that we've splattered everywhere, including on your water bottles, and please drink lots of water if you're not used to being at elevation. Oh wait, all of you know that. You're used to being at elevation. But please remember that. Um, the Tibet Himalaya Initiative only formed uh, two years ago here at CU Boulder. And um, part of the reason for that was to be able to raise funds to host this conference. And uh, we happened to have His Holiness the Dalai Lama visiting CU Boulder. Um, and that created the occasion for us to approach the chancellor and request uh, $20,000 to start to seed um, Tibet and Him Himalaya kind of um, events. So we've put on, um, you know, dozens now at this point of guest speakers, film series, visiting artists. And it's been so exciting to have this kind of impetus here in Boulder where there's so much local interest. So last night, those of you who came to Professor Charles Ramble's lecture saw that for an academic lecture, on Tibetan sacred landscape, we had more than 100 people, standing room only. And that just doesn't happen everywhere, but in Boulder, Colorado, um, there really is public, keen public interest. So some of you who are here have, have come and given talks, uh, including um, Dinesh Padel, Sarah Schneiderman, Sienna Craig, Sarah Harding, and others. So we, we look forward to inviting others of you here to see you Boulder. Um, and I want to acknowledge then, not just the activities we've been doing, but the people involved. So the host team, um, we have Emily Yeh, Carol McGranahan, myself, Holly Gailey. Rupak Shrestha, um, I have to say, has um, really been the one to pull all the logistical details. Every email you got was from him. Um, every badge that you're wearing was printed by him. All the wonderful bling was ordered by him, catering, etc. I also want to mention early and late parts of our team, the hosting team, and that would be Ariana Maki. I don't know if she's arrived yet, and um, Sam Sontag really, really helpful on the ground support. And then we had others who joined us for an organizing committee who helped review um, the papers and panels and roundtables. Terry Allendorf, Sia um, Kedzior, um, Pasang Sherpa, Andrew Nelson. So thank you to all of those who um, helped in that way. And then we have the obligatory thank you of people who are probably not in the room. But uh, uh, Tibet Himalaya Initiative, the Chancellor's Office, the Center for Asian Studies, the Sadra Foundation, the President's <coughs> Center for the Humanities, the Center for Humanities and the Arts, and the Research and Innovation Office at CU Boulder. So a lot of different entities across campus came together to make this possible. And it's such a delight after a year of planning to actually have people in the room and begin our wonderful conversation together. So I believe Rupak has a few logistics, other logistics, and then we'll uh, start our introductions. Thank you, Holly, for so many overstatements about myself. <laughs> <laughs> but welcome to Boulder, everyone, and I'm sure, um, and thank you for being here in Boulder. It makes it fuller and richer 
uh, border is already too rich, but you guys can reach out with your own hearts and souls. Yeah. So I just wanted to make a note of the volunteers. If the volunteers could please stand up. Hopefully we are down here and not upstairs. All right. Thank you. And without support from the volunteers, this conference would not have been possible or highly possible. Well, let's say not possible. <laughs> so on the name tags, on the labels down here, mine doesn't say, but most of the volunteers would say volunteers. So if you have any questions, feel free to tag down someone and ask if you have any questions about the conference. And one more logistical thing is about registration. We have we had registration going on before, that's why we have name tags. But we also have registration going on after this keynote talk, uh, during dinner and also after dinner. We also have registration going on throughout the duration of the conference, but please make sure, if you're here, make sure to register tonight so we get done with a lot of logistics stuff. And um, there's free Wi-Fi for guests. You all see you guests, so you have all free Wi-Fi. So please check in at the registration desk. There's also uh, instructions hung around in certain areas <coughs> upstairs. So Wi-Fi and parking instructions, please check upstairs. And besides that, welcome to Boulder. <laughs> to welcome you to the conference, to our campus, to our home, um, and to say just how nice it is already to look out and see so many old friends and colleagues and um, younger scholars or folks who I haven't met before who I look forward to, to getting to know in the next couple days. I, I want to also tell you, for anyone who is interested in sharing, whether it's information or thoughts from the talk or the conference in general, that the <coughs> hashtag for the conference is um, hashtag HSC2017. And for those of you who are already on social media, you will know that Manjushri Tapas talked that there is actually an eager audience of folks, certainly in Nepal and India, who want to know um, what it is she's going to say. So please feel free to. So it's my honor um, to be the one to introduce Manjushri Tapa tonight, whose talk is titled The Stories We Tell and Those We Don't. Writer of fiction, writer of nonfiction, translator, journalist, interlocutor and inspiration um, for so many of us here in this room. It's dizzying, actually, to list all of Manjushri's publications, her publication venues, and the topics on which she has written. Um, nonetheless, I am going to try and do it without, I don't know, falling victim to vertigo. So the book that introduced me, um, and probably many uh, of you to her writing, um, was way back in 1992 when Mustang Boat and Fragments came out. And this was a nonfiction travelogue of sorts. Uh, her other nonfiction books um, are also worth reading if you have not read them. Actually, everything she's written is worth reading. But A Boy from Sickless, um, about the esteemed and the much-missed environmentalist Chandra Garon. A Forget Kathmandu, An Elegy for Democracy, which is a book about contemporary politics and history and life in Nepal. And when I was trying to think how to describe it beyond that, I thought, I'm just going to read out the table of contents. Because actually, the chapter titles, I think, give you both a sense of not just the content of the book, but also the mood of it. So the introduction is titled Reading Nepal. Then we have The Coup That Did Not Happen, The History Exhibit, <coughs> The Wind, The Haze, The Postmodern Democracy, The Massacres to Come, and The Unfinished Revolution. Her most recent non-finished book is titled The Lives We Have Lost which collects her reporting and her editorials on the Maoist Civil War um, and on the still unfinished peace process. Her novels um, uh, are also just as full and, and rich, and actually I think one of the ways Rupak was, <laughs> was nodding towards, uh, All of Us in Our Own Lives, which just came out, so I actually have not had the chance yet to read, Seasons of Flight and The Tutor of History, as well as a collection of short stories titled Tilled Earth. In terms of translations, um, she's translated numerous Nepali works into English, again, uh, way more than I could list right now, but including Ramesh Bikal's A Leaf in a Begging Bowl. Um, she edited the book, The Country is Yours, Contemporary Nepali Literature, and most recently is translating um, the Darjeeling-based writer Indra Badur Rai's 1958 novel, um, There's a Carnival Today. And just recently out, just this past August, Last August is September now, right? September 1, so last month. The most recent issue of the Nepali literary magazine Lalit, which is focused on translation. 
and we actually, um, not only is it full of good stuff, but Sagar, Sagar Lama, who's here, hand carried 30 copies for us from Kathmandu. And so after the talk tonight, we will have copies of this available for sale for $10 upstairs for anyone who would like to buy a copy. Okay, however, even all of this, kind of listing uh, the different titles um, and projects, doesn't capture the range or the depth or even the scale um, of Manjushri's skill as a writer. Her gifts are paired with an observational um, acuity and a self-reflexivity um, that I think we really all benefit from. Her writings can be found in just about every possible English language publication in Nepal, as well as many in India, in the US, in Canada, and the UK. Um, some of them, the Hindustan Times, the Globe and Mail, Newsweek, Foreign Policy, the London Review of Books, the New York Times. Kerry Washington narrated a short story of hers. That Kerry Washington, right? Olivia Pope, Kerry Washington. Um, and here is where I want to say not just welcome, but also thank you to Manjushri. Thank you for enlightening and for enlivening our world. Um, we as scholars, we tend to be a bit trapped by genre. Um, we tend to be clumsy with language. And as Lama Jab, who's our keynote speaker for tomorrow, said in this morning's session, we can get caught in theoretical trances that sometimes can be hard to get out of. Your writing opens paths and clears ways um, for many of us. And it also brings pleasure and delight in the reading. So thank you for all you write, for your fearless writer's imagination, and for all the places it clearly takes you and then us. So the last time Manjushri was in Boulder was September 2015, which was the launch here in the United States of the Jaipur Literature <coughs> Festival. Her visit here coincided with the writing of a new constitution for Nepal. Many topics were being addressed and were on the table. And one key issue had to do with gender, specifically the ability of women as mothers to transmit citizenship to their children, an act that would recognize women as full citizens of the country. When announced, however, the Constitution did not have this right. Citizenship <coughs> remained available through the father only. In her article, No Country for Women, Manjushri explains how she reacted right here in Boulder, at the Boulder Creek, along which I'm guessing some of you actually walked here this afternoon to get to this very room, to this very talk. And what she did was she burned a copy of the Constitution. And I'm now gonna share with you her words about this event. She writes, it was not a matter of levity to burn the Constitution of your country. For a writer, burning any kind of text feels like a sacrilege. In the days after the vote and before the formal promulgation of the Constitution, I looked for arguments and counter-arguments for and against burning it. I read about B.R. Ambekar burning the Manusmiti, the text that enshrines caste and also gender bigotry in Hinduism. After September 16th, I followed the news of others in Nepal who were going to burn the Constitution in the Madesh, in indigenous communities. I was hoping not to have to do it myself. I was at the Jaipur Literature Festival at Boulder, Colorado, when on September 20th, President Ram Baran Yadav placed his final seal of approval on the Constitution. There was a session on Nepal at the festival. I and the other panelists discussed the Constitution. Just beforehand, I'd gone to the banks of the Boulder Creek and quietly, without ceremony, burned it. The act felt funereal rather than defiant. I was mournful rather than angry. Something in me, hope perhaps for a better future for Nepal, had died. My loyalty had faded. Man nai morio were the only words I could speak. The fire flared, blazed briefly, and flickered out. My emotions toward my country burned away. That's the end of that. Prepare yourself. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming our first keynote speaker, Manjushri Talbot. Thank you. Thank you, Carol, um, for bringing back such a personal memory of Boulder. I'm going to put all of this down very carefully so I don't trip up on any of these wires. And Sorry, <laughs> place this here and try not to move. Um, <laughs> uh, 
it's wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you to all of the organizers of the, the conference and um, to Carol, who was my point person here, and to Rupak, who indeed managed to get me here. Um, it's a pleasure to be among scholars. I, as a writer, always take the liberty of, that I got from uh, Gayathri Chakraborty Spivak when she talked about the distinction between uh, the wild practice and theory. So I feel like I can be a wild practitioner and it's always very bracing and sort of educative to be among scholars and um, catch up on some theory as well. So um, I want to talk today about uh, Nepal's civil rights movement and how over the years, this is a talk that's going to make me feel very old as even Carol's introduction <laughs> did. Um, I realize how long I've been writing. Um, but uh, everything I believed at the beginning of uh, my career, if we can call it that, as a, as a writer, um, I began to question once I learned about the ne uh, civil rights movement in Nepal. So as Carol mentioned, I'm just finishing a translation of Indra Badurai's novel, Azirami Tasha. Uh, many of you who are Nepali will have read it <laughs> um, and uh, really can't avoid it if you're studying Nepali in the college curriculum in Nepal. You have to study it. It's an iconic novel. Um, written in 1958, um, it's about post-independence Darjeeling at the very start of two major political movements which still mark Darjeeling today. One is the Naxalite or communist uh, labor union movement in the tea plantations. And the other is the formation of a Gorkha identity or a, a Nepali identity, a common Nepa a pan Nepali identity in Northeast India and the rise of the demand of a Gorkha land state in India. So for me, with my background in Nepal, um, it's been particularly fascinating to see how the Nepali language functions in India, where it's, of course, a minority language. Um, it's, you know, uh, Nepal is not, uh, Nepali is not a, a, a small language. It's, it's kind of a middling language. Um, <laughs> I've read that it's the 54th largest language in the world, which means almost nothing, but it's, it's not a tiny, tiny language. You know, it's, 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 it's there as a power. Um, Overall, it's uh, the mother tongue of about 24 million people worldwide, uh, mainly in Nepal and India and Bhutan. Um, in Bhutan, it probably enjoys the least power um, as uh, anywhere else. Um, it's the language of the Lhotsampa minority, who were many of whom were expelled in the 1990s. So it's a lingua franca there. A lot of people speak it, but it yields almost no power in the state structure. In India, it's spoken by about 3 million people, mostly in the Northeast. Um, as in Bhutan, Nepal is also, Nepali is also the mother tongue uh, or the lingua franca for people who have other mother tongues too. Um, but it's also the mother tongue of, of uh, people who live in India. Uh, the language actually came to be one of India's 22 official national languages thanks to the efforts of Nepali-speaking cultural figures from Darjeeling, uh, such as Indrabadur Rai, who was very central to that. Um, and Ganeshlal Subba, who led a movement that in 1960 obliged the West Bengal government uh, to allow Nepali to be used as a language of instruction um, or an uh, official language in the hill regions of Darjeeling district. Um, so a lot of the, the construction of Nepali identity in, or Gorkha identity in, in India has been around the Nepali language with a lot of people from other, with other mother tongues coming together with this lingua franca and identifying with it as a, a group. Uh, later from 1978 and 79, Indra I chaired the Akhil Bharatiya Nepali Bhasa Samiti or um, the All, Nepali, All India Nepali Language Committee, which is the body that ultimately succeeded in 1992 in obtaining constitu constitutional recognition for Nepali and making it one of India's official national languages. So a lot of work has gone, many decades of work has gone into giving Nepali language the status that it enjoys in India today. Even after all that, it's in very narrow, narrow circulation in India. Um, Indra Rai is not unknown in India. Um, he's certainly not unknown by his peers in the literary world. Uh, he was the first Nepali language writer to win the Saitya Academy Award for a book of literary uh, criticism of, on Nepali literature called Nepali Saitya Adararu in 1976. The Saitya Academy in India is the center of um, literary power, let's say, for all of India. Um, he also served as a member of the Academy's 
executive committee as well as the convener of the advisory board for Nepali from 1978 to 1988. So he's, he's got a fair amount of recognition as a, a, a very central um, cultural figure in India. Despite all that, uh, he's not been widely read in India because he just hasn't been translated very much into other Indian languages. Some of his stories have been translated previously into English. Uh, his novel has never been translated before. It was written in 1958. Um, there are a few other stories that have been translated into, English, uh, into Hindi or Punjabi or other languages. Um, but let's say the Indian reader, let's say from the south of India, who might know about the Hindi writer Prem Chand or about the Bengali writer Masveta Devi or seek out their work in uh, translation, wouldn't know about his work. He's really off in a corner by himself. Um, so I'm hoping, of course, to change this with my translation and to introduce his work to an Indian readership primarily so that uh, Indian readers can hear stories from the Northwest of their own country and get a sense of how rich uh, the literary culture of their Northwest is. So for me, the powerlessness of the Nepali language in India, relative powerlessness, was pretty eye-opening as I translated the novel. Because of course, that's not at all the situation in Nepal, where Nepali is the language of cultural and political hegemony. As scholars of Nepal will know, uh, Nepal, Nepali was declared to be the country's only official language in 1959, and the Panchayat regime deployed it as an instrument of national unification and cultural assimilation over a heterogeneous and multilingual population for many, many decades. Uh, the entire education system, the entire sort of uh, uh, establishment uh, rallied around this. And from the 1960 on, the 60s on, the literary world for its part got busy with canon building, lionizing Bhanuvakta Acharya and other writers whom we all read when we read the Nepali language, uh, Nepali literature as, as the canon. So uh, any number of books, if you studied the, you know, Nepali literature in college, uh, any number of books that you can find about Nepali literature will, will tell you this is the canon. Um, my, for me, it was Michael Hutt's own book was very formative in giving me a, an eye into what, what, what was the history of Nepali literature. Um, so these are all excellent resources and, and it's not difficult to figure out what the canon is in Nepal. Um, following the establishment of democracy, several language rights groups uh, uh, language rights and language revitalization movements started up as a part of this gathering civil rights movement. So what I mean by the civil rights movement um, is that, you know, in Nepal there have been a lot of uh, rights movements that have been segregated by uh, communities. So there's the Dalit rights movement, there's the women's rights. Um, you can call it a movement. It started as a lot of NGO work and welfare work. Um, and has coalesced into a movement. There's the Janjati or indigenous rights movement. There's Madesi rights movements, which are very um, strong right now. Um, and <clears throat> so all of these movements have sort of um, come up with their own histories, all of them basically related to the first quest for democracy in Nepal, which was in 1950. So, but they've been simmering in the background, they've been growing in power, and they've been intersecting more and more with each other. Um, but uh, even after all this, uh, there's, you know, even now there's a very strong push to have uh, primary language education in the mother tongues. So all of this is still going on, but in part because of this long history of um, having Nepal, Nepali be Nepal's only official language, um, it remains very, very powerful in um, the country. So interestingly, sometimes, you know, when the, the state is soft and Nepal has gone through times when it's soft and when it's hard, Right now it's a little hard, but it has been soft for many uh, decades before this. Um, when the state is soft, it's possible for a few very uh, dedicated, um, serious activists to really get things done. Uh, Indra Badar Rai's contemporary, the poet um, Bairagi Kaila, uh, the mo high modernist poet Bairagi Kaila, launched a study in the 2000s about how many languages Nepal actually has, and you know, to give them re official recognition. And he did this when he was the chancellor of the Nepal Academy. Uh, and this was all during the civil war, the Maoist war was going on and there was uh, this, this uh, demand for more representation for the marginalized was, was growing. And so all of this came together 
to eventually lead the Nepal government to recognize that there are 123 languages in the country, which is a big breakthrough in terms of how we imagine Nepal. Because even though everyone always said, oh, it's a very diverse country, there was never really a number attached to that diversity. So suddenly it, it went from being you know, a country where Nepali was the official language to a country that you know, had 123 different languages with Nepali still being the main language of you know, state uh, transactions, governance, economic transactions, education, the media, everything is still very overwhelmingly Nepali. So for me, Nepali also remained till uh, quite recently the language of Nepal's literary imagination. I was a product of the Panchayat era Naya Siksha Niti or the new education policy which enforced Nepali as the language of education in 1971. It was a terribly difficult subject um, for, I think, a lot of people. Um, it was certainly the one I did the worst at. What little fluency I, I had, I lost uh, later when my family moved to the US, and then I had to regain the language when I went back to Nepal after college. So I decided to relearn Nepali in order, you know, because I saw myself as a Nepali writer, so in order to really put myself in the milieu with other Nepali writers who were writing in Nepali. As I, learn, as I sort of deepened my engagement with Nepali language and started to read the literature, um, I noticed a few things. First, it's a very, very rich literature, uh, despite very harsh conditions under which it, it's come up with very little investment. Uh, there's a lot of absolutely beautiful literature, uh, a lot of sophistication. I really fell in love with the language and, and with the sort of aspirations that it was um, giving voice to. But I also noticed other things, such as in the Nepali language, as in a lot of um, fairly formal languages, there's a big gap between the vernacular spoken language and the written language. Uh, it's, the written language is very, very formal and Sanskritic and high. Uh, and so this is you know, not so much the case in English anymore, where the vernacular and uh, the spoken and written languages are much closer in diction. So to read Nepali literature, I really had to learn high Nepali. And you know, everyone agreed that this was what Nepali literature was written in. So I had to learn the proper hill Nepali or sort of Sanskritized Brahminical Nepali, um, or the Nepali of Nepal's Chetris and Bounds, who have recently come around to naming themselves the Khas and Arya people, I think to give themselves greater historical weight and legitimacy. Um, so as I acquired this Brahminical, sort of highly Sanskritized Nepali, I started to translate literature as a way of engaging even more deeply with literature. Um, and I would really recommend, if any of you are interested in translation at all, I would highly, highly recommend it as a way of engaging with a, a body of work. It's a very intimate um, engagement. And again, to quote uh, Gayatri Spivak, uh, who's translated Mahasvata Devi from Bengali into English, she describes it as an act of love. And so for me, it really has been an act of love. It's been, uh, I decided, because I'm not a professional translator, I'm a writer who translates, uh, I can choose which pieces I really love and I can translate those pieces. Um, so I started to gravitate to words, the kind of literature that I gravitate to in you know, American or European or any other kind of literature, which is work by women, work by people outside the power centers, um, people on the margins of society. So my decision to translate really uh, kind of uh, deepened my views on Nepali literature. Right off the start, I kept noticing and pointing out to other writers that even when characters were, um, you know, from villages and speaking uh, very, in, uh, supposed to be speaking very informally, they used this very high diction. There was this sort of fixation with using this high Sanskrit Brahminical Nepali, even when it came out of the mouth of a peasant. Um, I also noticed that the readership of literature was quite narrow. Uh, in a country where the literary, literacy rates are quite low, uh, where ordinary readers don't have a grasp over this high Nepali, um, literature remained and still remains kind of inaccessible to the wider public. But somehow there was enough prestige in the literary world that it, you know, writers didn't seem to mind this. It was still a very respectable thing to do. Uh, I also noticed that outside of a few regional writers, most writers were from Kathmandu and wrote about people from Kathmandu. It was impossible to miss that most writers were either Baun or Chetri in caste, uh, or maybe Newar because everything was so Kathmandu-centric. The invisibility of women and writers from outside of Kathmandu and the sort of incredible exclusivity of Nepali literature puzzled me at first and then really began to needle me. Once I got an overview of Nepali literature, I had to conclude that in its 100-year-old history, 
um, modern Nepali literature really hadn't quite found a space for Nepal in it, in, its, in Nepal's full diversity. So I wrote that in the very sort of first major um, undertaking that I did. Um, I'd been, I'd translated the uh, Ramesh Vikal's short stories earlier, but then after that I, I uh, Samrat Upadhyay and I and uh, Frank Stewart co-edited an issue of Manoa magazine and the University of Hawaii to really give an overview of the canon of Nepali literature. And that was my first big realization was that something was amiss in the world of Nepali literature where Nepal just, you couldn't really find Nepal in it. You could find a very narrow slice of Nepal. So my next major foray into translation was putting together The Country is Yours, um, which is an anthology of 49 Nepali writers that I uh, translated in the mid-2000s. I deliberately sought out the work of women writers, writers from communities outside of Kathmandu to re redress this exclusivity of Nepali literature. I really didn't have a lot of luck. The book does include 17 women, uh, but 33 men. Uh, it consists of work by writers who wrote in the original Nepal Bhasa, which is Kathmandu's indigenous language, uh, Maithili and Tamang. Uh, there were several from Nepal Bhasa and one piece each of the others. It contained some writers from Pokhara and the Madesh, but it mainly consisted again of writers in Kathmandu, from Kathmandu. Uh, the book still gives a, a more inclusive look at Nepali literature than most anthologies, uh, but what it taught me above all was the sheer difficulty of trying to make literature um, inclusive in Nepal. The sticking points to this were many, so there was still this ongoing fixation over proper Brahminical Nepali. Um, and that really kept the other, sort of other kinds of writers, including indigenous writers, um, including Dalit writers, whose language, you know, this was not uh, traditionally. Um, it really kept their writing from gaining legitimacy in the literary world and being published widely. That's changing very fast now, but that was certainly true in the 2000s. Uh, there's, uh, there was the on incredible maleness of the literary world in Nepal was another sticking point. There's a very strong old boys network, um, and there's almost this sort of incredible segregation between women and men. And again, the absence of stories from the rest of the country and the Kathmandu-centered focus. All of these just became sticking points that, uh, that were very hard to overcome. But one of the main sticking points for me was the dearth of translation into Nepali of literature that was written in other languages. So for me, as the uh, person who edited the book or as the person who translated all of this work, purportedly to put together a collection of Nepali literature, um, I could only read Nepali. And there's no way for me to access all of the work that's been, taken, that's been taking place outside of it without translation. So after all of those years of engaging and reading, with Nepa and reading Nepali literature, following it, meeting writers, translating it, I really didn't have much of an overview of what was happening outside of the Nepali language. Um, it really was out there. Um, by virtue of the fact that Kathmandu is the homeland of Nepal Bhasa, um, I knew a little bit about Nepal Bhasa writers and um, Nepal Bhasa has sort of made a little more space for itself in the literary canon. There are you know, book and magazine publishers in the Nepal Bhasa, um, and there's more translation into Nepali than from other languages. Um, there are also some other magazines uh, from o in other languages like Tamang and some of the Rai languages. Um, but you know, I, I can't read those unless they're in translation, and there's very little trans uh, translation of that. So I didn't know of Maithili or Bhojpuri writers, um, like Mahendra Malangia, who's in another collection, or Dr. Dhirendra Jha, who I sought out. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't know other writers of, who were writing in Hindi or, you know, Bhojpuri, Avadi, or any of the other languages of Nepal. They just kind of hadn't found a space in Nepal's literary world. So um, even after all of these years, <laughs> the sort of incredible silence in terms of what I, the stories I was hearing and the stories I wasn't hearing was pretty uh, astounding. So in the end, I relied on a couple of books, whatever I could find, several magazines that had some translations and included some work by Pratap Bol Tamang and Shivakumar Khaling and Dr. Dhirendra, but again, it's very, very limited. It's very overwhelmingly Nepali. So it dawned on me only after that, and I suppose I'm a little dense for that, that ne the Nepali language was itself central to the problem of exclusivity in Nepali literature. So 
all of this reading that I'd been doing, again, I was doing it at a time when the civil rights movement, which is still in Nepal, I, I find a little frustratingly, understood as being separate movements. Um, all of the, those were kind of moving closer to each other. So the Dalit rights movement, um, you know, was sort of beginning to inter uh, face criticism about having not very many women in its leadership. The women's rights movement has long had the problem of being very overwhelmingly high caste led and not having indigenous women in it. The indigenous rights movement has the same problem with not many women being represented. And so all of these movements were beginning to kind of collide with each other and interact with each other and intersect with each other. In, in what I think is recognizably a sort of civil rights moment in Nepal, um, but it's not called that, which I find a little frustrating. I think it is important to recognize that that is what Nepal's been going through, is a sort of wave of civil rights uh, movements. So um, for me, it took the civil rights movements to make me see that the Nepali language um, is actually really the language of two caste groups specifically. Uh, who amount to less than 28% of the population. That sort of crystallized my view onto Nepali literature. Then I began to see that it was a wonder that there were any sort of Dalit or women or Janjati or um, Madishi writers in the canon at all. And I'd, I was surprised at how blinkered I'd been before and how deeply the roots of the new education system had sort of blinded me to um, all of this. Later on, I mean, as, as I became aware of this, and as we still see right now, language is very much at the center of power in Nepal. It's um, through language and wordplay, particularly as the constitution got drafted, uh, that the center controlled the peripheries and really sort of wrested back power for itself from what should have been a very decentralized um, new constitution. We saw this in uh, what uh, Carol was mentioning about the the provisions related to the, the citizenship clause, where the big demand had been that citizenship be passed through women or men, so that women didn't have to be tied to men. It had always been through women and men, so women were always dependent on men. Um, and so there was this incredible play of words at, towards the end, right up to the last moment before the constitution was uh, passed, where they did put an or. They said, okay, we've put an or, um, and then it turns out they've got other clauses that sort of completely negate that and sort of tie women back to men and um, sort of uh, have this, this incredible language of bloodlines and the male bloodline being uh, more important than women's lines. So this kind of language play and the, the, the power that language has in Nepal and in the Nepali state structure today um, became very obvious to me. So. That, for me, I think has crystallized who I want to translate going forward, which is, of, again, of writers very much outside the power center of Nepal. So this is very different from what I want to write about myself. I feel like, for me, as a writer, there's a difference between what I sh should or what I want to write about as opposed to what I want to translate as a translator. The act of translation, again, is a kind of act of love. It's a, it's, it's an, a formation of um, alliances. It's a collaboration. It's a way of um, showing solidarity and of giving voice to uh, or amplifying someone else's words. Whereas writing, if I were to write about the marginalized community myself, certainly through fiction, I haven't done it so far because I feel like that's really not my job. I feel like I would be silencing other voices. I feel like um, in nonfiction there are more respectful ways to do that, but certainly in, in translation it's become quite clear for me, which is how I've uh, arrived at Indra Badr Rai's novel, which is again a minority language in India with very little power in India. Um, and so I'm very comfortable with uh, sort of translating a work of Nepali that will give a, a powerless community greater um, agency in, its, in, the, in their country, um, or to add strength to a community that lacks power. So uh, just recently, I've tried again one more time to <laughs> see how I can intervene in, uh, in all of this in the Nepali literary world and to again try and see if I can help make it more uh, inclusive. So this uh, uh, magazine, the Lalit issue, uh, it's called Translations from the Margins. 
And um, it's, again, more inclusive than any of the previous work I've done. Um, it contains 22 women to 29 men, which is pretty good for Nepal. Um, <laughs> it um, uh, also contains work directly translated from original works of Nepal Vasa and Maithili. Uh, thanks to, uh, we had a couple of translators who could move directly without the intervention or uh, the middle stage of the Nepali language. So uh, uh, translators like Kritish Raj Bhandari or Ryan Conlon. Um, could just move from Nepal Bhasa straight to English, which was a huge find. Um, and uh, there's a Wamboli Rai story translated from the Nepali. There's a Dolpali testimonial, which was translated straight from Dolpali. Um, and the collection also includes a lot of younger generation writers who are much more iconoclastic than the older generation writers. It gives a very good sense of just how dynamic and rich uh, Nepal's lit literature actually is and can be. Um, but it still doesn't adequately represent Nepal's full diversity. The piece I loved the most um, in this whole um, endeavor was, was a piece I translated of the poet Ahuti, who is a Dalit poet. He was born to um, a Sarki family, which is a, a cobbler uh, caste. And he's written an, um, several collections. Uh, he's written a no uh, several novels, several collections of poems. And in one of his uh, poetry collections, he's got a very beautiful essay called The Story of My Poetry about how someone like him who grew up in a house that only had two books, both religious texts, ended up being a poet. Um, so I just want to read a little um, excerpt of the excerpt that I translated to give you a sense of uh, the importance of this kind of translation. There were two books related to the classics at home. One, the story of the Hindu epic, the Swasthani, the other, Krishna Charitra, or stories of Krishna. The book on the Swasthani epic stayed in a dark, windowless prayer room for the gods Veer and Vayu, which I was scared to go into alone, even in the daytime. As for the book titled Krishna Charitra, it was forever being tossed from side to side in the detritus of the shoe cobbling workshop. That book was thick, it didn't have a cover, its color was faded from having grown soiled. Some pages were folded and dog-eared, some pages were half-ripped, and the top right corner was puffed up like a ball. No one ever read that book, but grandfather would get upset if anyone should mistreat it and toss it around when moving the cobbling tools. Don't throw books around like that, he'd say. That's all he'd say. Even grandfather couldn't keep the book in a safe spot. So he writes a little bit about how he developed uh, through school, and um, then he went he started to study poetry. I went up in school, and my study of the poetry of the excellent pundits began. Bhanubhakta Acharya, Lekhnath Paudel, Somnath Sigdel, Lakshmi Prasad Devkota. I loved to read poems, and since Nepali was my mother tongue, I always scored high marks on the tests. But those poems never spurred my mind to writing poems. Rather, the unfathomable greatness of those poems gave way to a certain demoralization, a demoralization about poetry in my mind. When I reached the age to dream and think about life goals, my first dream was to become the undying lover of some girl. Along with that, to become a doctor and also a writer. Third among these early dreams was the dream to be a writer. But never till my youth did the dream of becoming a poet arise in me. Neither did I feel that I could write poetry. Why I dreamed at the time of being an undying lover or a writer is not necessary for this story, as it's unrelated to poetry. I'll surely write about it elsewhere. But once I started writing poems, I understood why the desire to write poetry had never before arisen in me. To be honest, the reason was the forced used use of Sanskrit verse in Nepali poetry. My grandfather was the only Sarki man of his generation in all of the 36 Sarki houses of my villages who could read and write and do mathematics. Some casteless, wandering ascetic had taught him. But grandfather didn't know Sanskrit. Neither my lineage nor my entire community had any relationship with the Sanskrit language or with Sanskrit verse. There were folk songs and fables in each of our veins, but the textbooks contained no folk songs. Being considered untouchable by Sanskrit verse kept me from falling in love with poetry in my youth. When I create a poem that truly satisfies me, I think of that rebel poet who was born in the Brahmin caste, Gopal Prasad Rimal. Had he not been there or had the age of free verse not begun in, Nepal po in Nepali poetry, I wouldn't exist. Perhaps Shamal would be here, but Bimal Niva and Shravan Mukarung, impossible. As far as I know, today's Binod Bikram Khatri or Sangeet Srota wouldn't exist, and neither would Bimal with Nibasha or Sarita Tiwari. 
Sapnil Smriti, Bimala Tumkhewa, Raju Syangtam, and especially that Kewal Binabi, no one would be there. Instead, there'd only be Mitralal Pangani among good writers and among those who persisted in writing Devi Nepali. Writing and writing rules have no social class, but, for certain, but certain classes can use them for special interests of their own. In this sense, Sanskrit verse was used in Nepali poetry as a representative of Hindu feudalism. When I hear someone claiming that only proper poems, that the only proper poems are those written in verse, I feel as if some corpse has risen from the grave to plead a case. To view verse as necessary in poetry and to consider free ver verse poems inferior is to claim Nepal's indigenous Dalit, Chetri, Sanyasi, or non-Brahmin people have no right to poetry making. So you can see the, the sort of um, kind of ethics with which he's approaching the writing of poetry. So for me, this experience of putting together Lalit was again hugely humbling because I realized that what I set out to do cannot be done by one person. It has to be a massive collective effort. And this already was a collective effort. The magazine has many editors. There were a lot of translators. Uh, a lot of, it was a huge uh, effort. And uh, one of the things that was really wonderful is there are a lot of English writers now in Nepal who are beginning to translate into English. So it was, it was a uh, collective, but it really, the kind of uh, thing that I really would like to do, which is to create, maybe just say one um, book of truly representative Nepali literature would take a huge amount of effort of people working between languages and collaborating with each other. So let me explain to you what an inclusive Nepali literary canon would look like. Nepal's largest languages of the Indo-European family after Nepali are uh, Maithili, Bhojpuri, Tharu, Bajika, Dotile, and Avadi. Their speakers consist of approximately 12, 7, 6, 3, 3, and 2 percent of the population, respectively. There are also languages of the Tibeto-Burmese family, the largest of which are Tamang, Nepal Bhasa, and Magar. Their speakers consist of 5, 4, and 3 percent of Nepal's population, respectively. So, an inclusive collection of Nepali literature would contain works originally written in Nepali, Maithili, Bhojpuri, Ta, Tharu, Tamang, Nepal Bhasa, Magar, Bajik, Bajika, Dotili, and Avadi. So those are only the 10 largest languages in Nepal. It should include Hindi writing because Hindi is the lingua franca of the entire southern uh, Tarai Madhesh <coughs> belt. Uh, it should also include the work of some of the remaining population of Nepal who speak more than 100 languages some without scripts, some on the verge of extinction, some with printing presses and a sort of uh, publishing uh, culture, and some without. So is that feasible at all? Um, you know, uh, is it feasible to even expand on that and make all of ne you know, Nepal's literary canon truly uh, inclusive? Um, I mean, of course it is, with a lot of help from a lot of people. Um, it's been going on elsewhere where you know a lot of uh, canons are being challenged and opened up and being made inclusive and there's a lot of scholarship going on in Nepal uh, by Nepali scholars by activists language rights groups um, so there's a lot of scattered knowledge around um, you know uh, what what hasn't happened is a sort of collation of of this scholarship and a, a framing of it in any way but it is obviously possible to do um, just not very easy. So I want to end uh, on a note uh, about how scholars like you do and uh, can contribute to making Nepali, uh, Nepal's literature truly inclusive um, in the absence of any large collective effort to do so. One would long, of course, for another Bairagi Kaila to uh, uh, take this kind of work forward from you know, the Nepal Academy. Uh, there is some translation work happening in the academy, but it's, it's, it's uh, not n nowhere near enough. Uh, but right now, and certainly in the last few years, uh, it's, there's been a, a pretty strong backlash from the, the Chetri and Brahmin sort of um, establishment against the civil rights movement. And there's been a very strong resurrection of sort of foundational myths of Nepal. Um, placing Chetri and Brahmin culture back at the very center of the state in a sort of nostalgic or even regressive impulse, which seems to be a little bit of a global 
phenomenon right now. <laughs> um, but I think that the civil rights movement will overcome this temporary setback because just the demographics are on its side. Um, the arc of sort of democracy in Nepal has been towards a widening of rights. Um, and I don't see how uh, Dalit women, Janjati Madeshi, um, the LGBT movement, the, the sort of disability rights movement, you know, this is not going anywhere. This is here to stay. So I, thi I think it will re regroup and go on. And in the meanwhile, you know, a lot of scholars in Nepal and also outside are generating a lot of knowledge. So really what um, needs to happen is for that to continue until one fine day, uh, someone, uh, a fine scholar, maybe one of you, will come along and reframe all of this and sort of really help bring it all together in some way so that we can stop seeing Nepali literature as the, the voice of uh, overwhelmingly Chetri and bound men with a few other sort of tokenistic voices mixed in and so that the stories we hear can finally really represent Nepal um, and so that Nepal can find space in Nepal's literature, which would be a really nice thing. Um, and it really matters because stories are uh, the inner life of a community uh, or of a people or of a nation. Um, they're the stuff of human subjectivity. They're the dreams, the desires, the sort of aspirations, the disappointments and the deep frustrations um, as, you know, human life lived out by specific individuals in a specific time, culture, place. Um, stories are very powerful. They can be used as they have been in Nepal to mythologize and to control people. Um, they can also be used to speak the truth and to free people. So I really believe that Nepal can only really be liberated from the cultural hegemony that has been its heritage, that has been in its history, when all of us begin to hear each other's stories um, and to really listen to one another and to find out what we're talking about. So I think you know it's something like a 20-year project um, to, to kind of reframe all of this and, and to, to get this conversation um, not just going because it is happened, it is taking place in Nepal through language rights activists and writers, um, but to really get it central uh, in the literary dialogue. Um, so the kind of scholarship all of you are doing can add to that. I would beg, um, I know some of you are, Pushpa is a translator himself um, in this collection. Some of you are very inclined to look for literature and to highlight literature and to work with literature. Some of you are not. Um, I think it would be really valuable if, if all of you sort of gave a special look into literature at some point in whatever communities you're working in, if you're translators at all, if you're interested in translating, to translate so that uh, those voices can be amplified. And it really is the kind of uh, thing that I think a civil rights movement is made of, of national reimagining is made of, of cultural reimagining is made of. So I would beg you to do that. And finally, I just want to end on a slightly defensive note. <laughs> um, in case anyone thinks I'm being too harsh on Nepali, on Nepali literature or the Nepali language and feels that that too needs protecting because it isn't one of the world's most powerful languages. I mean, it's surrounded by Hindi, Bengali, all of these languages that have a lot more power and a lot more resources behind them. Um, but I'd like to point out that it is to Nepalis the Nepali language's benefit to be treated as a robust and living entity um, and to be challenged and made demands of and to be asked to grow. Um, that's what's going to make it grow and evolve and rejuvenate itself and that will keep the Nepali language itself vital. So, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Lots to think about. I'm sure many of you have comments and questions. But I'm going to let Manjushri take questions yourself. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. If there so are. Please, someone get us started. Thanks. I had a question about about Nepal Bhasha in terms of how it's being used. That you're talking about it being very Sanskritic, but are there any contemporary authors who are um, trying to have? Uh, Characters who speak in their own vernacular ways of using Nepal Bhasa within the There's uh, so Nepal Bhasa refers to the what would have been called the Newari language, which is the, the language of uh, indigenous to Kathmandu Valley. 
Nepal, Nepali itself is the, the national language. Uh, so there are now a lot of writers have come around to uh, using a, a more spoken diction and a more informal diction and uh, not coincidentally a lot of these writers are not of the sort of high caste proper sort of you know uh, heritage. So um, there's been a lot of uh, uh, some writers like uh, there's a writer called Kagan Songrola who has written in dialect entirely, which is interesting. Uh, there are other writers who just have simplified the language very much. So that's that's been a very strong movement. Just recently, I would say in the last maybe ten years, it's really come up, and people have reacted to uh, the sort of incredible formality of of Nepali. Please see that. Wonderful. That was uh, you know you mapped out uh, quite uh, nicely uh, the kind of language, politics, and situation in Nepal. I have two questions. One is that uh, I'm Nepali Brahmin. <laughs> I, uh, I know the body language quite well. Yeah. But um, I looked at uh, all the kids in the rural areas and urban areas that and no one can actually speak either Nepali or other language without mixing 50% of their words in English. Mm -hmm. um, how do we deal with that situation? Shall we bring into kind of global hegemony of language and the uh, political and geopolitical kind of domination in picture to really talk about that? Um, because is it really Nepali language dominating or it is something else actually that is actually allowing Nepali language to be uh, something like that. It's a, I think it's a next generation probably will not even speak Nepali. That's where, where I think it's going in terms of uh, you know, their, their priorities right now. And my second, which you tried to allude at to at the end of your talk is Nepali language is also vulnerable, but I want to hear you never mentioned English You've never captured that, and I was kind of curious uh, why. And another question is that all non-Nepali language that you mentioned, uh, I actually know other languages too, Tamang and many other languages, they are not in the written tradition. They follow oral tradition, and that's very established scholarship for them. And to be inclusive language in Nepal, if we actually ask them, okay, write it, otherwise you are not included, is that, isn't that another form of actually uh, you know, denying their historical practice of, uh, you know, language and all things. What do you think about that? This oral tradition, and only if they can write, then they are included. Isn't that another, and what do you think about hmm. uh, Okay, two complicated questions. So, the, in terms of the, uh, I mean, I, I would agree with you in terms of Kathmandu. I've seen a lot of uh, Nepali, and certainly in Darjeeling too, this has been the case. With the English education system, a lot of people lose the, the, the strong grasp over the Nepali language. Um, I feel like that's a very natural part of any of these power uh, sort of plays between languages. English is obviously a very much more powerful language globally, and so Nepali uh, is in in not danger, but is, is there is the dynamics of it being diluted by English because English comes in and is the more attractive language to learn and is the more powerful language. Um, that certainly happens, but I don't feel like it's anywhere close to being eradicated or uh, being forgotten. Uh, I, if, if you go through high school at all in the government schools, there's no way you don't have to learn all of those amazing grammar rules and amazing sort of um, uh, complex formations of the Nepali language. So I don't really see that it's threatened. Um, I do see that in Kathmandu it's kind of fashionable to throw a lot of English in, but I, I'm not really seeing it in the rural areas. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's, uh, I, I wouldn't, I don't feel so defensive about the Nepali language. I think there are a lot of people who, and there are certainly writers who are very proud of that high Nepali and will write in that Nepali and will keep it alive. I feel it's like a pretty strong community. Um, so I don't really feel quite so defensive about it. I also think Nepali as a whole will become stronger if it uh, takes in other languages and becomes more usable and uh, so, you know, English has taken in a lot of languages from other languages, and I think Nepali, because it's a lingua franca, is almost obliged to take in other languages and absorb them and become a large and usable language. Um, there can always be a sort of strain of the high proper 
Nepali, and there will always be, I think. But um, I think especially because it's a lingua franca, it's almost obliged to be very flexible and open. Um, in terms of uh, the written versus oral, I agree with you. And I think that is actually, I would love for someone to do um, something like a, a baseline study or uh, some kind of mapping exercise of what stage the literatures of different languages are in. Not a stage uh, implying that they all progress in a certain way, but to say, okay, this community, let's say, has a lot of oral literature, um, this, or has a lot of folk tales. That is, as far as I'm concerned, that's as legitimate as modern writing. So I think any hierarchy that places modern writing as the higher form is obviously incorrect. Uh, all of it is literature, as far as I'm concerned. But I would love for some, you know, again, it would take such a massive collaboration for this kind of uh, mapping exercise to happen, where we know, uh, for example, we know Newari, uh, the Nepal Bhasa has a lot of publishing happening. Uh, but we, you know, and there's a lot of modern <coughs> production coming out, as well as the traditional literatures. Um, but we don't really have an overall sense of what there is in the Tamang language. You know, I know that there are some magazines, there are some modern writers, but we don't know how much of that's going on. We don't know uh, the overall sense of, again, this scholarship exists. It just hasn't been brought together by anyone in a sort of framework of, of literature. So yeah, I think that would be a really fascinating and very, very valuable. Again, it would take something like the Nepal Academy to lead it, you know, to really like, change the framework of how we look at literature and how we think about Nepal's literature. Um, It'd be really valuable. If you know all these languages, you should do it. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Uh, you spoke about uh, genre earlier, um, and about how um, writing about other cultures, uh, perhaps um, without um, silencing other voices, is easier in, in nonfiction um, than uh, in, in writing fiction or uh, like novels, as somebody you know, who's written uh, a, a lot of both, uh, in a lot in both genres, um, why is nonfiction more useful while writing uh, about more marginalized communities uh, for you, or you know, it, is there um, is there a certain drawback in, in using um, uh, fiction to, you know, to, to talk about? The this, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's more useful. I would say nonfiction is easier um, because nonfiction assumes. So when I'm writing about someone, I'm always on the outside. If it's nonfiction, I ask. You know, you interview people, you observe, you do whatever. But you're writing about them from the outside, whereas fiction is really going inside people, and is really about subjectivity and about the inner world of the person. And so, uh, even if you are writing about what someone tells you. For example, you know, when I've interviewed uh, victims during the Maoist war, and they you know, talk about their trauma, I'm still stuck writing about what they tell me. Right? So I'm not imagining their pain. I'm not going inside them. And that's what fiction requires you to do. So you know, I, I, I had uh, this dialogue with a, a Madesi friend who's also a writer, um, who has <laughs> for a long time said, you really should write about Madesi women's plight. And you know, I agree that someone should write about it. I completely agree. In fiction is what he was saying. I just don't see that I'm the person to do it because I think there are other writers who are doing it and my job is to sort of find them and highlight them rather than me go in and try and... And it's just too hard for me right now. I just can't do it without feeling like I'm usurping someone else's space. Um, I don't think it's the same for all writers. I mean, I think some writers, and I, I, as an absolute rule, I don't believe that we shouldn't write about each other. So I, I do believe that you know, uh, we can imagine our way into other experiences. Absolutely, we can. Um, I just, I, I'm very, very uncomfortable about the power dynamics in that, in fiction. It's just my, my solution, not what everyone needs to do. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I, I just want to thank you so much.
for being so honest about how you feel about your contribution in terms of language, not knowing other languages on one hand, but also trying to explore in uh, and bring it out to the material world in India and other places. Putting a uh, marginalization of language in two layers. I think that was very interesting. Uh, my work is primarily currently uh, with the native communities in the US. Uh, and one of the things that we talk about and we're writing about is the sociology of absence. So when you talk about you know, who tells the stories, who, who doesn't tell the story, it's a very similar idea in terms of who is, uh, when research is being conducted, who is at the table, whose story is being told, who is being told. Um, and so in that context, what you are uh, asking us to do and what you are trying to do is really, really, really uh, humbling to me uh, in that uh, how I see it is you are trying to um, contribute to knowledge democracy by bringing other languages, other stories from other languages. It's, it's so hard though, because it really, I mean, I feel really helpless and I do feel like it took me 20 years of sort of writing and translating to get to the realization that actually I know very little. Um, and, <laughs> you know, I, and, and, uh, and, and so myself feeling very humbled by it and um, sort of uh, a little embarrassed by the, the brashness of my earlier efforts to sort of explain the canon or, you know, to reckon with the canon. Um, there's so much work that has to be done and again, there is a lot of scholarship happening, particularly in you know, the activists in Nepal. There's a lot of scholarship happening. I think there's just, um, it's, it's all so scattered and there hasn't been any effort to, or any resources or any interest. Nobody's interested in literature. <laughs> there's been no interest in trying to bring uh, the literature world together in, in different languages. Yeah, it's, it's, I feel really helpless. <laughs> One more question? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Charles. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Manjit. Um, you um, came up with a, an admirable list of um, languages that ought to be translated in order to represent the, uh, the canon of uh, languages in the park. I was curious why you omitted Tibetan from the list. Um, I can imagine why. It's a language that's well taken care of by translators with a center of gravity somewhere else. And I was wondering if that's the reason why you thought it wasn't necessary to be included in uh, this development. Well, you know, after all, there's uh, a substantial body of literature uh, leading the North Nepal borderlands into the about Nepal. Yeah. There is, um, I, I was going, I think that list was almost entirely by the size of the language in Nepal. So it was just, it was just that. Um, and as you say, Tibetan does have, we were actually one of the translators for this issue was um, capable of translating from Tibetan straight into English literary translation, again, which is very different from translating the Dharma or translating other kinds of um, uh, traditional stories. Um, so we did have the translator ready, but we couldn't find a modern Tibetan language writer in Nepal. Um, so <laughs> the whole, um, it, it, it's going to take a lot more coming together of all of the scattered people um, for that to happen. But yeah, I mean, as you say, the, and, and there is, uh, obviously there's also a lot of Tibetan writers writing in English now, and um, it is a, a, a big and um, growing body of work, a little bit outside of the Kathmandu Center. All right, so well, I know there are probably more questions and comments I want to invite you all to continue the conversation amongst yourself and also with Manjushri upstairs because we have a lovely dinner ready for everyone catered by our local um, beloved restaurant called Sherpa's, which is owned by Pemba Sherpa. So please join me in thanking Manjushri and then <laughs>